My name is Sai, and before I get started on this, I want to give you a bit of background about the, the talk. So there are many, many talks about tools, about cross-platform tools, which will guide you through the tools feature by feature and tell you how to use them. And those, those talks are all fine, but I wanted to actually build something, show how you could use these tools to build something interesting. So I came up with some goals. My first goal was to develop a small cross-platform application live. I wanted to target Windows and Linux because that's a really, really common use case for many, many tools. I wanted to demonstrate dependency handling because this is a, a real problem in, in the C++ community. We don't know how to handle dependencies well or there are many, many different ways to do so. So I wanted to show one way. I wanted to build something powerful not just a silly toy example, something where you would look at it and say, wow, it's amazing that you could build something like this in an hour. And that's kind of the kicker. I only have an hour. I want to, to build something interesting with not very much time and show how the tools are useful. So I had to think and I came back to what I usually do, which is, is build a compiler. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, my background is in compilers, as, um, as I said in the introduction. So this is something that I'm interested in, which I have experience in. And so maybe a, an alternative title for this talk instead of live compiler development is write a compiler in an hour or cry trying. That's what I'm going to try and do today. Okay, so a compiler has a source language and a target language. The source language is the language it takes as input and the target language is the language it outputs. The source is usually something like C or C++ or Swift or Rust, and the output is usually an assembly language like x86 or ARM, but it could be another source language. Like you could have a compiler which takes in C++ and generates C. It's usually called a transpiler, but it's still a kind of compiler. The source language I'm gonna be writing a compiler for today is BF. Now, it looks kind of strange, um, but it actually makes a lot of sense. I'm going to guide you through what this language does so you understand what the compiler is going to work like. BF operates on what's essentially an infinite tape of cells. Each cell can be between 0 and 255. So we have an infinite memory, and then we have a pointer. And that pointer is where we're currently looking in that memory. There are eight instructions in BF. This is the entire language, eight instructions. And each instruction is a single character. Now, as you saw, it looks kind of weird, but some of these are fairly self-explanatory. Like the left arrow, it moves the pointer to the left. So every time the program ex executes the left instruction, the pointer is going to move one space to the left. Similarly, the right arrow is going to move it to the right. The plus instruction, as you might imagine, increments whatever we're pointing at. So if we're currently pointing at zero, then it will be one and then two, so forth. And the minus will decrement it back down. A little bit less obvious are the input output operators. Comma is read from standard in. So this will read a single character from standard in and write it into where we're pointing. And then dot will write whatever we're pointing at to standard out. The final kind of instruction is a loop. So loops are demarcated with square brackets and anything which we put within those square brackets will be repeated until we get to the end and, um, and what we're pointing at is zero. So we loop while we're pointing at something greater than zero. For example, if we put a minus in here, then we'll just keep on looping down until we get to zero. And that's the entire language. Okay, x64 is going to be our target language. This is the 64-bit version of x86 assembly. And I'm not gonna explain it right now. I will, um, you know, as we're building the compiler, I'll explain what instructions we're using, but we're going to use a very, very small subset of x64. It's a massive, complicated instruction set, and we're all only going to be, um, be using a little bit. These are the tools which I'm going to be using. 
um, Visual Studio, CMake, WSL, VC package. Um, hold on a second, I'm getting a request for someone to get remote control of my screen. I don't know if I should be approving this or not. Can one of the hosts tell me? I didn't hear you. Can you repeat, please? Yeah, I'm getting a... Uh, please, please ignore. Um, okay, ignore. Okay. Um, right, moving on. Yeah, so these are the tools I'm going to be using. Um, Visual Studio is my IDE, CMake for building, WSL for targeting Linux from Windows, and VC Package for dependency management. You're still going to um, get something out of this talk if um, you don't use these tools, because either they'll be applicable to, um, to your own tools, or you'll just get to see me fail writing a compiler, which is always fun. Um, some alternatives to these tools you might use Visual Studio Code, C Lion for IDE, Mison Build 2 for building, all of these options. Okay, I'm going to get started. So, I'm going to be using Visual Studio 2019, and I'm going to create a new project from scratch. There is a CMake project template in Visual Studio, so I can just go ahead and use that to create a new project. This will go away, will boot up Visual Studio, and this is now generating me a bare CMake project. So this is just everything we need to get started. I'll guide you through a little bit of what was generated. So we have a single project. If you're not familiar with CMake, it's not too important, but we essentially have a project. That project has a single subdirectory called BF, and in that subfolder, we have a single executable. And that executable uses this source file. So this is just a description of how to build our project. Inside this file is just a simple Hello World program, and I don't care about that, so I'm just going to delete it. Now we can get started on our compiler. So our compiler is going to have three stages. First, we're going to take in our source code, and then we're going to generate assembly out of that. This is called the compile step. From that assembly, we need to generate an object file. This is called the assemble step. And then finally, from that object file, we are going to generate a executable, which we can run on our system. And that is called the link step. Quite often, you'd have more than one object file, like if you're um, linking C or C++, but we're just going to have one. So I'm going to go ahead and just um, stub out all of these functions. The compile step is going to be where the majority of our time is spent today. The assembler and the linker, I'm just going to call out to external tools because writing a linker and an assembler is, is complicated. The compiler is fine. All right, so we need a couple of files. We need an input file, which is going to have our, um, our input code. And we're going to call that hello.bf. We need an output stream. Oops, stream. We need an output stream, which is going to store our assembly. I'm going to call that temp.asm. Note that we're immediately getting an error here because we don't have isstream available right now. If I hit control dot, this actually gives me the option to, to just include it from the IDE, which is one of those nice little features which you can, um, can help make you more productive. Now that we've got our input files, we can get started. So remember that BF is just a bunch of characters, and each character means something. This means that we can have a single character, and then while we can read something from standard in, we're going to switch over what this character is. It's so just every character, we're going to understand what character it is, and we're going to output some assembly. Now, the potential characters we had were right, left, plus, minus, comma, dot, and oops, loops. Now, like many editors, um, Visual Studio has the option to use multi carat editing. If you hold Shift and Alt, then you can write all of these at once, and it just saves you a little bit of time. OK, so that's my cases. And then I want a default case, which just breaks. OK. Now we can get started on writing out assembly. Now we want to move a pointer to the right if we see this instruction. 
remember that we have infinite tape of zeros and a pointer which is going to move up and down. And we need to store this pointer somewhere. And the easiest place is in a register. So I'm going to use R12. So now if we want to move the pointer to the right, all we have to do is increment R12 by one. The, relative, the relevant instruction for that is add into R12 one. This is x64 assembly. And hopefully, as you can see, it's not too complicated. This is a very simple instruction. We add one into R12. Very similarly, if we want to move it to the left, instead of adding, all we do is subtract. Now, if we want to change what's at the pointer, then it's going to be very much similar. But instead of adding 1 to R12, we want to add 1 to whatever R12 is pointing at. We do that by adding some square brackets around R12. We also need to tell the assembler that we want to treat this as a single byte instead of two bytes or three bytes or whatever. And now this is our first four instructions all done. Now, remember I said that I wanted to target Linux and Windows? Right now I'm only targeting Windows. If I want to target Linux, then I'm going to have to use WSL. So I'm going to switch back to my slides and tell you about WSL. WSL stands for Windows Subsystem for Linux. The idea behind it is it lets you install Linux distributions easily. Now note, this is not like Sigwin where you essentially have a Linux shell inside a Windows environment. This is actually a Linux distribution like Ubuntu or Mint or Kali. It lets you run bash shell scripts and Linux command line applications like everything you're used to, you know, Vim, Emacs, Node, Ruby, SSHD, everything you're used to from a Linux environment you can do in WSL. My favorite thing is that it lets you install additional software using the Linux package managers. You know, Windows is getting a package manager in a little bit, but um, the Linux package managers are so powerful and really useful for um, having a productive developer environment. So being able to use this from Windows is, so, is really, really powerful. Interestingly, it also lets you invoke your Windows applications using a, a Unix shell. So if, like me, you're absolutely useless at um, CMD or PowerShell, and you're much rather work in Bash, then you can actually execute all of your Windows programs from Bash, and it will all just work. Um, one thing is WSL2 is now generally available. So WSL1 has been around for a long time, and now WSL2 is around. The difference between the two is shown here. So they both give you integration between Windows and Linux, fast boot times, small footprint, um, and they run with VMware and VirtualBox. So the difference, main differences are WSL2 is actually a full VM. It's not a kind of VM where you're used to. Like, as I said, it has fast boot times, it has a small resource footprint, but it is still a VM. And that lets us ship an entire Linux kernel. So there were some applications which you couldn't run in WSL1 because they needed a full Linux kernel to run. Now you can run those in WSL2. WSL2 also has way better file system performance inside the Linux environment. So if you're reading files inside the Linux file system, it will be super fast compared to WSL1. However, if you go and read files from the Windows file system in WSL2, it will be very, very, very slow. So the WSL1 gives you broadly um, equal performance between the two, but a bit slower. And WSL2 gives super fast Linux reading and very slow Windows reading. So these are some things you might want to think about if you're wanting to use WSL. If you want to install it, then you just run a single PowerShell command, and then you can install a distribution of your choice from the Microsoft Store. There is a bunch of, um, of distributions which are, are natively supported, like Kali, Ubuntu, Mint, and a bunch which are supported by the community. So there's ones for Arch and things like that if you would rather use Arch. And w I will get on to WSL. OK, so if I open up Ubuntu, this is a full Ubuntu installation, exactly what you're used to. I can run LS, I can run APT, 
I can run uh, carousel, get little car, anything you're used to. If I want to target WSL from Visual Studio, um, the experience you might be used to is, you know, creating a new configuration and configuring SSH and everything like that, but it's way easier now. All we do is we go to manage configurations, we start a new one, we scroll down to the bottom, which has all these WSL ones, and we pick one and save it. Now this does everything for us. This finds our, um, our compilers, it, um, sets up CMake, it sets up SSH, it sets up copying of, um, of source files, it does everything for us. So now if we want to target WSL, all we do is switch our configuration here, and you can see it's found CMake, it's found GCC 7.4, and it's configuring CMake. So soon this will all finish, and these two will go away. There we go. So now if I hit control shift B, then this will, oop, assemble was not declared. Ah, here we go, add a typo. So if I go and build, then build succeeded. And then I can go ahead and build for Windows by switching configuration and hitting control shift B. Build started, come on, there we go. Okay, so this is a little PowerShell. I can go straight into, um, into Ubuntu from here just by typing WSL. And now you can see that in art, oops, in art slash build, I have um, two folders, well, three folders. I have WSL and I have the Windows version. So I can go ahead and run art slash build slash x64. And that just ran our Windows compiler, which we built. If I instead run the Linux one, then it's the same thing. Just to prove to you to, that this isn't a cheat, I can run file on these. And this is a, a Windows application, this .exe, whereas the other one for WSL is an ELF application for Linux. So these are actually Windows executables and Linux executables, which are ran from the same place, which is really nice. Um, this is the, ooh, the assembly is empty because I don't have a source file yet. Um, so I've, I had a, a Hello World program just kicking around in my folder. You don't have to understand what this is doing. Just trust me, it's Hello World. And if I go ahead and run my compiler, then I should get, here we go. This is the um, parts of the assembly which will represent this, um, this program. Okay, now we can go back to, oops, I missed some breaks here. That would not be good. That's essentially just running all of the um, cases for every single instruction. Not good. Right, so now we've done our first four instructions, we can get on to the rest of them. Comma, if you recall, is um, getting a character. Um, we could do this with system calls. It would be a nightmare on Windows because they're not, um, they're, they're not documented. So I'm just going to call into libc. I can call getchar, which gets a single character from standard in and puts it into the al register. So I can move AL into R12, and this will get a character from standard in. Very similarly for writing, we're going to call putchar. So first we move into CL from R12, and then we're going to call putchar. Now this and um, the C12, uh, the CL and the AL are just defined in the um, the calling conventions for the platform. So there's rules which say where you should put um, return arguments and where you should put um, arguments to the function. 
now is our loops. Loops are a little bit more complicated. Remember that we have a sequence of instructions and a loop looks like this. Now how it works is we're going to be executing all of these, then we get to the start of the loop. We then do a check. Are we pointing at zero? If we are, then we jump past the end. If we're not, then we're going to execute all this code and then jump right back to the start where we do a check again. Maybe we go and do another run or maybe we jump to the end. Okay, so another problem is that these can be nested. So if we're going to implement these, we need to be able to match up these labels. So how jumps are usually executed in assembly is you write out labels, which essentially mark points in your program where you can jump to. Now we have to match up the labels between um, the start and end of the loop. The easiest way to do that is using a stack. Whoops. So I'm going to have a stack of integers called labels. And then I'm going to have a current label which is going to start at zero. Now we can start implementing our loop. The first thing we need to do, remember, is when we get here, we do a check. We're going to check if what we're pointing at is, um, is zero. But before that, we need a label to jump back to. So we're going to output a label. And a label just looks like this. It's going to be label and then our current label, and then start colon. That's going to output a label so we can jump back to it later. Now we do a comparison. We compare what's in R12, that's what we're pointing at against zero. And if what we're pointing at is zero, then we're going to jump. That's what JZ means. And we're going to jump to label, current label, end. We're going to write this label later on. Okay, we um, need to push our label. Now, note as a little aside, if I um, do labels dot, some of these IntelliSense options have little stars next to them. This is actually done with machine learning. We've trained a, um, a model on a huge set of open source projects, and it recognizes the kind of context you're in and sees, oh, in this context, you probably want to either push something or get the top. So it puts those options right at the top of the list so it's easy to get to. In this case, I do actually want to push my current label. Oops. I want to push my current label to my stack. And I want to increment my current label. There we go. That's the, the start of the loop. Now the end of the loop. So this is kind of a, a little bit simpler. But the first thing we need to do is when we get to the end, we jump right back to the start. This is done with the jump instruction. And we jump to label, labels.top, start. That's the label we wrote out earlier. Then we need a label to jump to from here. Remember this label end. So we write in label, labels.top, end. Okay, so that should implement our um, the end of the loop. We then need to, to tidy up the stack by popping the top label off and break. Okay, so this is actually the entirety of our BF compiler, at least the, the part which is reading in instructions and outputting code for them. There's a little bit more work we need to do to set up all of our memory, tear it down, but this is essentially everything. I do kind of have a problem with this though. I really don't like IO streams, just as a library. IO streams is the, the standard you know, output method in C++ where we have all of these chevrons, we have to interrupt our strings so that we can then you know, put this current label in here. It's really difficult to understand what's going on here. What I would much prefer is something like Python. You know, Python has um, placeholders where you can just um, dump 
things into your strings. There is actually an implementation of this for C++, which is coming in C++20. Um, I don't have C++, a C++20 implementation um, with that library on here, but I do have VC package. Now what I can do is I can go into my CMakes list and say find package. I then get a list of all of the possible packages I can install using VC package. And you know, if you click on one, then it gives you a little description, which is quite nice. I want formatlib, which is a formatting library for C++. This is essentially what made it into the standard. So I can go ahead and say, find package format, and it's required. And if I save this, I get an error because if I expand this, it says we couldn't find format. I don't have it installed. But there is an option to install format using VC package. All I have to do is click on this and it will go download the source from the internet. It will build the code using our compiler and it will install it so that we can link against it. So this is now building format lib. It might take a little bit, so while it's doing that, I will talk about VC package. VC package is an open source project, which is on GitHub. You can check it out there. It's a package manager for C and C++ libraries. It runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, so it's not just a Windows thing. This runs anywhere. And the repository contains over a thousand packages with more being added all of the time. The packages are contributed not just by Microsoft, but also by people in the community. So if you have your own package or you know, a package which you depend upon and you want to add it to VC package, you can just send us a pull request or write an issue. And we're, we're generally really fast in getting those all, all merged. An interesting thing about VC package is that all of the libraries and their dependency chains are tested. What that means is if you get um, a version of the VC package repository, then you can be pretty sure that any package, uh, any library you pick will be safe to use, at least you know, as far as their testing goes. Oops. You can export binary packages. So while VC package by default is source-based, like you saw it pulling down sources and then building, you can export the binary packages. So if you um, you know, have a bunch of developers, you can build packages once and then distribute all those packages to, uh, to your developers. It does support private libraries. So if you have libraries which you don't want to make open source, um, but you still want to use in VC package, that is um, supported. You just have to write your own file which describes how to build it, which is all done using CMake, and then it's supported and can just use all of the same um, infrastructure as all the open source packages. You can and you should pin your dependency versions, by which I mean you don't want your dependencies to be upgraded without you asking. That's just a recipe for disaster. So you can, when you get VC package, everything is locked down to a single version. And unless you explicitly upgrade something, it will not change, which is really nice. Coming soon in VC package, we have a lot of plans for it. Binary caching, this is again to stop you building from source all the time, building once, caching those binaries, and unless something changes, can just reuse all of those. Manifest files, this is something people have been asking for for a really long time. If you're used to um, NPM uh, from the Node project or uh, Cargo from Rust, this is pretty much a similar thing. It's a file which describes your dependencies and your versions. And you can distri um, distribute this file alongside your project. So if anyone gets your project, they know everything which they need to build it. And all of these dependencies can be pulled down by it just automatically and you don't have to do anything else. Package federation. Currently, there's a single source of truth, essentially, for VC package packages, which is the GitHub. Um, we are adding package federation, which means that other places will be able to have their own repositories of packages, and you can just point your, your VC package instance at those and go and get them, similar to how APT works with its, um, its sources. 
We're also going to be shipping uh, VC package in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, so you won't need to pull it down and build it yourself. You'll just have it right there as long as you have VS or VS Code. Back to the demo. So installation of format has succeeded. It's even given us this handy um, CMake line, which I can just paste in here and change the, the target name. So this will link, oops, this will link our, um, our executable against format. Now, if we go back to our project, hash include format slash ostream.h, then it should regenerate all the CMake, and very shortly, I should have full IntelliSense and everything ready. There we go. Is this found it? Oh, there we go. Okay, so now if I head down here, I can say format, and now I have full IntelliSense of the format lib. Say format print, and now I can get to transforming this into something a bit nicer. Get rid of all these chevrons, get rid of this, replace it with the placeholder, replace all this, oops, and give it current label as an argument. And this is way easier to understand. We have label something start, label something end, and current label will get substituted in. If you're familiar with Python, it's exactly the same kind of thing. I much prefer this to, to O streams. It's way faster as well. Like the, um, the person who wrote format lib has done an amazing job at optimizing it so that if you're using um, IO streams right now and you switch to, to using format lib, then you'll find that your output is just is way faster. It's a combination of, um, of how IO streams works with lots of virtual functions and this is all um, much easier to optimize. Labels up top. Okay. I hope you will agree that this is much easier to understand as well. The last one I need to change is actually here. I, I kind of lied a little bit earlier. Um, CL is the place we wouldn't put arguments, but only on Windows. On Linux, this is going to be something different. So I can uh, go ahead and write format.print. Again, get rid of the chevrons. And here I'm going to substitute in a register, and I'm going to call it argreg. And further up here, I can just have an if def, which checks if we're on Windows. If we're on Windows, then argreg is going to be CL. And if I were on, Win uh, on Linux, then argreg is going to be DIL. This is just what the, the calling conventions say um, the register should be. Note that as soon as I did this, the um, this branch actually got grayed out a little bit. You can see the difference. That's because in this configuration, we're building for Windows. So it grays out the Linux version. It's quite a nice little visual feature. You'll see if I, if I switch to Linux, then this should flip. There we go. Now this one's grayed out. It's just one of those nice features for, for helping you work out what's going to be compiled at any given time. Now we're almost there. And like I said, we haven't set up this memory yet. So we need to do that. This is done in what's called a prologue. The prologue is essentially just a part of the program which um, tells you how to set up the, um, the stack frame and the rest of your program. And then there's going to be an epilogue which is going to tear everything down. So I'm using this as a, a C11 um, raw string literal. It just means that I don't have to, end, to add all of those end line characters and things like that. Okay, our prologue. First, we need to say that underscore start is going to be um, the, um, where our program should start when the executable is run. Then we have a bunch of people raising hands, but I don't know how to... Um, <laughs> view the chat in this room. I'm just going to keep going and someone can jump in on voice if I've, something's gone horribly wrong. I need to 
say that get char and put char are external um, functions, which we need to link in later. We're also still going to call exit later, so I'll put that here. And then section.text is where code goes. Then we say underscore start, and this marks the entry point for our executable. And we need to um, allocate all of the stack space, and we need to zero it out. We allocate it by subtracting 4,000. You know, I don't have infinite memory on this computer, so 4,000 sends infinite enough. This should be sub. Um, so that allocates our space, then we need to zero it. Fortunately, x64 does have what's essentially a memset instruction built in. So we say move, we're going to write the byte zero, we're going to write it 4,000 times, and we're going to write it, and we're going to start at RSP. Then we call rectsdosp which has a funny name, but that's what memset is called. Finally, we initialize R12 to point to the, the start of this memory. And on Windows, we have to allocate a little bit more space on our stack for calling functions. That's our prolog. And then at the end, we need our epilog. This is a lot shorter. And we're going to do the same thing. Let's have a raw string literal output epilogue. All we need to do here is reset the stack pointer, which we do by adding 4,064 to the stack pointer. We're going to return zero from the whole code, and we're going to call exit in libc. That's our compiler. Unless I've made any mistakes, then this will execute the equivalent of our BF code. All that's left now is our assemble and link stages. Like I said, we're going to call out to um, external um, tools to do this, so that I don't have to do it myself. So it's a little bit different on Windows and, and Linux. We're going to use NASM for our assembler, which is the, uh, the system, uh, the netwise assembler. All we have to do is say we want to generate a 64-bit Windows application, um, object file even. temp.asm is our assembly, and temp.org is where we want to store the result. If we're on Linux, it's very much the same, but instead of Windows, we generate an ELF file. And usually, this is called temp.o instead of obj. And if that's our assemble stage. The link stage is a bit of a nightmare. Um, on Windows, finding all of these um, components, like finding the linker and finding the C library is a nightmare. So I've just cheated a little bit and I've put them in um, environment variables. So I can just go ahead and say linker and you see RT, which is the, um, the C runtime or libc equivalent, are in link 64 and ucrt 64. OK, the other nightmare on Windows is if we want to call out to the system with a bunch of external tools, you just need to do a bunch of string um, escaping. It's really horrible and looks like I'm just making stuff up, but it will work, honestly. This is going to be our linker. So we're going to call our linker. We're going to generate a, um, a console application subsystem console. Our entry point is going to be underscore start. Start. temp.obj is where we put our object file. We want to generate hello.exe as our output. And then we need our C library. And I think that should be enough quotes to appease the Windows gods. Give it our linker, our UCRT. And that should hopefully be everything. Then we can just call it to system, system with our command. 
and we're done on Windows. Linux is a lot easier. Linux, we just call straight out to the system. We call LD, which is the system linker. We're going to link against libc. Uh, temp.o is our object file. Hello is going to be our executable. And then the little bit of magic we need to do is give it the 64-bit version of the dynamic loader. Don't have to worry too much about this. It's just one of those things we have to do. All right. And end if. So if I've done everything correctly, then we have just built an uh, entire compiler for Windows and Linux. So I can go ahead and build that for Windows, succeeded. I can go ahead and switch to Linux and build that. And hopefully this should build, taking a little bit of time, finished. OK, we can go ahead and run our Linux compiler which generated hello and a bunch of assembly. Let's have a look at the assembly just to make sure it looks okay. Here is our prologue down to about here. And then you can see here's label zero start, one start, two, three start, three end, four start, four end, and then two. So this is our, there must be a, a nested loop here. So this three is nested, three and four are nested within two. So the, our stack is working here, and then two, one, zero. That all looks OK. And then right at the bottom, we should have our, our epilogue. So that all looks OK. Um, we can then use our Windows one, and that built hello.exe. It should have mostly the same. You'll see this is now CL instead of DIL. Now, if I'm feeling very lucky, I can try to run both of these um, executables. So just to remind you, this hello and hello.exe are executables, which we have built using the compiler we have just written for this hello.bf code. And if I've done absolutely everything right, then this should print out hello world, hello world. Let's see. It worked. First time. Uh, it doesn't usually work first time. I'm very, very surprised. OK, we did not make any mistakes. We just wrote an entire compiler in um, how much time we've got. Yep, way less than an hour. And yeah, so now I have a few resources for you. Um, if you want to check out VC package, there's this link here, aka, AKA MS VC package, similar for WSL and our CMake support. Um, if you want to learn about targeting WSL from Visual Studio, you can go here or just um, find our blog. There's a lot of details there. I would highly, highly recommend watching this talk by Daniel Pfeiffer on Effective CMake, which was at CppCon um, a few years ago. It just tells you how to use CMake in uh, a way which will make it easier for people to use your libraries. And there's there's a wrong way to do CMake and there's a right way and it's hard to do it right. So I would really recommend going to watch this talk. I'd also recommend watching this one by Robert Schumacher, who um, is um, one of the people who works on VC package. Um, this tells you how to write packageable libraries. So how to write your, your libraries in a way such that other people can consume them easily. And with that, I am done. Thank you very much for coming along. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Sai, thank you so much. That was great. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure that everyone in the call uh, thinks the same. I don't know if you have a couple of more minutes since you promised to do it in one hour and you did it in less. Yeah, so, yeah, got, <laughs> yeah, if anyone has any questions. Um, yes, we actually, we actually gathered um, four questions previously and I believe if time allows, we will be getting more questions now. Yeah, so the, the first question, I'll be typing that in the, in the IM window so that people can see. But basically, is Samuel Pedro asking uh, that uh, Microsoft recently announced that DirectX is coming to WSL? Is there a chance of implementation in Linux natively? Uh, I don't know if you if you got the question. In the, in yeah, the, yeah. So the questions about um, DirectX support in, in Linux. Um, unfortunately, the DirectX team is is completely separate from um, from the C++ tooling team. So I'm I'm not sure about that. If you 
Um, whoever asked that can feel free to contact me um, directly, um, either on Twitter or at cybrand at microsoft.com and I'll try and find you the answer. Yeah, we will, we will share your, your email contact in, in, in this presentation. Great, we'll perfect. Done with, the, with, the, with, with the conference. But there is uh, a, another question coming from Alexandre Juca. Um, he's asking if, uh, what, what are the features you would add to C++ if you could? Uh, that's, that, that's a great question, actually. That's a great question, yeah. Features I'd add to C++. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in is um, dynamic polymorphism and how we can improve on the, the existing support for, you know, we have virtual functions and they have a lot of problems. Like if you watch any of Sean Parent's talks on, um, on dyna a lot about dynamic polymorphism, he goes into a lot of detail about um, some of the issues both in um, performance and understandab understandability, maintainability of um, virtual functions and large hierarchies. Um, so I think that there is a lot we could do to um, to fix that. One of the ways would be to have a um, a better mechanism for generating uh, type erased wrappers in C++. Um, if you go and watch my talk from, um, which one was it? Pure virtual C++ mm -hmm. um, on uh, meta classes, then I present a way to do that. And I think that's that's the main thing that I would change in C++ today. Okay, okay, and and things you would uh, uh, remove? Any, any, anything? Uh, well, I, I O streams is one of them. <laughs> I O streams, <laughs> I think so we, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we pretty much solved that one with with format lib, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would that would probably be my my answer. That's great. If you have a couple of more minutes, I have two more questions here. Yeah, and go probably ahead. some questions from the from 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 the audience. There's someone else asking, uh, what are your top five tips for a programmer who wants to specialize in compilers? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Specializing in compilers. Um, so I think my, um, my number one tip would be to get a good compiler book. Now, most of the, the advice you'll see about a good compiler book is mostly people um, talking about the dragon book. Do not buy the dragon book. It's really, really boring and dry and focuses a lot on parsing, which is parsing is not the interesting part of compilers anymore. You know, we've we've moved beyond that in the, the few decades since the Dragon Book was written. So don't buy the Dragon Book. Uh, my number one tip would be to get something like uh, Modern Compiler Implementation by Andrew Rappel or Engineering a Compiler. I can't remember who the author is that is, but get a good, like reasonably modern compiler book to work through. Um, another tip would be play around with LLVM. Uh, LLVM's documentation for the, the front end part is reasonably good. They have a very, very good tutorial called Kaleidoscope, which will um, essentially walk you through building a simple front end for a new compiler. So you'll end up with an end-to-end -end compiler built on top of LLVM, which is very nice. You know, it's it's LLVM specific, so it doesn't give you some of the, the generic overview that a good compiler book will give you, but practically it's really, really um, great to work through and will give you a lot of really applicable experience because there's a lot of work going on in LLVM these days. Um, I mean, I know you said five, but I think those, if you follow those two tips, yeah. then you'll be well on your way. <laughs> of course, yeah, five, five is too much. Um, so there are questions coming from the audiences uh, as well. Um, Bruno is asking, what are the opening opportunities for compiler developers? So it's more like, what, what are the, I, I would say, what are the career paths, maybe? Uh, yeah. I don't know, Sai, if you can uh, chime in on that. So um, as far as compiler work goes, there's, of course, work going on in, um, the major compiled languages like uh, system compiled languages like Rust, um, C++. So any companies which have um, a large involvement in C++ like, um, you know, like Microsoft, Red Hat, uh, Google, um, ARM, places like that all have, Apple will all have compiler work for, for C++ um, and also their own programming models. Like there's a lot of 
compiler work at Apple for Swift and things like that. Um, there's also an, um, in interpreted languages, um, well, languages which people generally talk about as interpreted, but usually these days are implemented with a, a just-in-time compiler like JavaScript. Um, so there's a, a huge amount of work on JavaScript just-in-time compilers like um, Mozilla or um, again, Google, Microsoft. Um, so definitely looking not just at the main um, like ahead of time compile languages, but also look at the uh, at who's working on interpreted languages or scripting languages, because there's a lot of really fascinating work in JIT compilers going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. Uh, so, so let me just tell people in Portuguese that they can also make, have questions in Portuguese. Yes. Pessoal, podem, podem fazer as vossas perguntas em português também. Aqui uma pergunta do, uh, da Silva Pedro, mas eu não consigo perceber bem o que é que ele quer perguntar. Qual é o programa que realmente recomenda para um novato? Uh, pode ser mais específico, uh, da Silva Pedro. Uh, so, Sai, there is a question here, but I believe you answered, but it's never too much. What is the, the most tricky part uh, in building a great compiler? Ooh, I think the... Made, uh, one of the the things which is still um, very much an unsolved problem is um, is optimization. So, um, like, what order do you run optimizations in? Which optimizations do you run? Do you run some optimizations more than once? When do you schedule them? These are all really difficult questions, which have a lot of um, a lot of research and industry work going on, um, because you know optimizing. Um, com making sure your code is optimal as possible has a huge rippling effect across the entire industry. So making these compilers as um, generate as fast code as possible is so important and it's really, really hard because like different optimizations will interact with each other and if you run them in the wrong order then they might make it worse and it's hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, Sai. I, I believe there are a couple more. I'm trying to squeeze in and as many questions as possible. So there's Andre asking, um, uh, he, he says he, he works as a compiler building and he would like to know where he can find the original C++ grammar. Original C++ grammar. Well, the, if you look at the, um, the standard, then at, there's an appendix which has um, a C++ grammar in it. So uh, technically you have to pay lots of money to buy the standard, but there's drafts available online. Yep. Um, so if you, if you just find a draft of, the, of a recent version of the standard and uh, look at the index or scroll right to the bottom, then there's a, a complete C++ grammar in there. Yeah. Bruno is asking, what is the difference between a compiler and a transpiler? Um, it depends on who you ask and um, how fine they draw the lines. Uh, to be honest, I don't really think that there's much difference. Like a transpiler is just a, is what people call a compiler, which goes from one language, which is usually used as a source language, to another language, which is usually used as a source language. So, um, you know, it does have some um, implications about the design of your compiler because, um, you know, most most compiler frameworks like LLVM are best are best suited to generating machine code because yeah. the the intermediate representation tries to emulate a um, a machine code or like a, a slightly higher level version of a machine code. So generating a source language from that means you have to kind of invent some things. But generally the, the difference between a transpiler and a compiler is, is not that strict. Great, great, great. Thank you, Sai. I don't think we have more questions. Uh, there's no more questions coming. So I will say thank you again. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, and a great demo, by the way. Uh, and feel free to stay uh, while we wait for Guido, the Python god. Uh, he is joining right now, so I will kind of switch back to him. Thank you, Sai. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Oh, muito obrigado. Uh, espero que tenham gostado desta primeira apresentação e demonstração uh, do SAI. Um, o Guido já se encontra entre nós. Eu vou só rapidamente, para os que entraram uh, um bocadinho depois, mostrar-vos onde é que nós já estamos. Assim, muito.